I'm sorry to blow your concept of, you know, maturing makes people mature. No, it doesn't. It just gives you a saggy jowls and lines on your face. That's what <laughs> maturing does. Today, Lois and I are going to talk all about friendships. Every video we've done up until this point has somehow glossed over this topic or touched on it. Uh, I think friendships are a element that touches everyone's life, whether you have luck in them, whether it it's uh, a hard thing for you to do, whether you were good at being a friend and now no one wants to talk to you. So t today, Lois and I are just going to share some of our experiences as being a friend, people wanting to be our friend, and not having any friends. How does that sound, Lois? Well, that's quite a subject. It sounds great. I think one of the things that has been on my mind a lot recently is um, the first woman who I consider to be like my true best friend. I was, we were so close for five years. It was a deep loving relationship, maybe longer than that. Um, I have this thing where like 10 years of my life feels deleted because I just was, I was 20 and I don't remember anything, but she was in my life during this time. And now our relationship ended very badly. Ooh. I know. And it, and it was a series of events that caused that, but I came out the the villain of the story, no matter however you shook it. And what I'm experiencing lately is, well, no, I don't want that kind of friend in my life, but I still miss her. Have you ever experienced anything like that? Oh, gosh, yes. Oh, absolutely. Sometimes, you know, um, thinking back now to somebody who was just... You know, she she was, I don't know how to say this. Um, she was very high maintenance. But in that high maintenance, you know, she made me feel needed. Yeah, so what was the high maintenance stuff that... <sighs> hysteria mm. at all, just hysteria. She was going through a... Um, I don't even think it. I don't even think it had reached the divorce stage. No, it hadn't. It was a separation. He left her for somebody else, and um, she just wasn't dealing with it well. And so, you know, she she just kept finding, you know, she was in survival mode. She was in drama. The, oh, high drama, high drama, high drama, and you know. I think I actually became addicted to that. And then I found out, you know, when I realized what was happening. I mean, not that I didn't know it, but I just stayed in it anyway. But once I realized that this was not healthy for me and she was, you know, she was getting somewhat nasty with me. and. I felt that, you know, she wanted me all to herself, you know, uh, yeah. couldn't have any other friends. And I tried to remove myself, Ugh, got very ugly, very, very ugly. So, yeah, you know, we get involved with people as, as years go on, you know, and not all friendships are meant to last a lifetime. It's just, even though you know that, I find that that's, a very hard thing to accept sometimes, especially when you felt you've had this very special connection with somebody that no one else can understand you in this way. And then all of a sudden they drop off or they ha decide to not love you in the way that they said they loved you unconditionally. I think I always took it as a um, rejection rather than a reflection of them. Oh, it, it, so so you really had a f had friend or friends that said they loved you unconditionally? Mm, or did that's you... That's a great question. Did so, you perceive that from them? I don't think I ever trusted that anyone could love me unconditionally. But as I chose to um, be vulnerable with people and cho choose to believe that they loved me, I think my hope was that that was an acceptance 
of flaws in acceptance of who I was because I accepted their flaws. And I, again, you know, we, you and I've talked about several times our, our penchant toward being attracted to narcissists who make, you know, or, or needing people. I think that's a sign of our own needing neediness. I guess the long, the short and long of it is I don't know that I understood that unconditional love could exist or if it could exist. And I sought it in these relationships. Really? I find it really interesting. Yeah. Tell me why. Well, <laughs> um, I wasn't privileged to have one, but I understand most mothers have unconditional love for their child. Right. Uh, my own experience has led me to see that the only unconditional love I've ever gotten were from my dogs. Yeah. So when someone says, I want unconditional love, I say, get a dog. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not really harsh. I'm just being realistic. Yes. Um, I can see that you could believe that your friends um, love you for yourself and in spite of yourself. Yes. But I can't, I can't understand... And this is probably not the forum to get into it. Why would you, you would expect unconditional love from a friend when I mean you really wouldn't even have it from a sibling? Lois, I'm actually you, you're like I don't know that I've ever explained my need out of a friendship in that way, and I'm really glad I did because anyone else would just go, "Sure, I know what you mean," or maybe not get into it. But you've chosen to like pause on that because it is an alarming statement. Listen, it's only alarming to me. That doesn't mean you know. I just, uh, I just always felt that there were boundaries and lines in every relationship, even you know, for significant others, probably more or significant others, that there were just certain things that you didn't say or, or do. do. And, you know, I just talked to somebody recently who helped me reformulate that thought, too, was that unconditional love doesn't exist, and that's more romantic, that you're with somebody or friends with somebody that chooses to love you and and makes it that, like, that works with the person you are. I, I guess I should. So I'm going to, I'm going to clarify a bunch of like really quickly. I'm not saying so that I can act like an asshole so that I can do whatever I want. I, I also didn't feel worthy of being loved as who I was just baseline Jessica. So I think I was just afraid whether my friends accepted me or not, whether that was unconditional or not. However, I, I I guess the reason why I'm glad it alarmed you is it's making me re-examine my role in the failure or successes of my relationships based on the pressure I put on these friends to reassure mm. me or, you know, make me feel better or love me for quote unquote who I was. So it's, it's actually very interesting. Okay. All right. Um, something for you to give pause and give thought to. Oh, totally. Okay. What is a good friend to you in your in your book? First first thought that comes to mind is that they've got my back. Mm. I find it difficult for someone to claim that claims that they're my friend and then will sit in a group and have people talk shit about me and then say they're my friend. That to me is you know, how can I explain? Well, let me say this. There are different degrees of friendship in my book. So there are what I would call really intimate friends, friends I can say, you know, I'm really feeling down about this. And they'll, you know, they'll actually want to listen. You know, when you're a strong individual, um, A, it's very hard for you to tell somebody else you need them or that you need anything. Mm -hmm. And secondly, they're so accustomed to coming to you that wow. they forget that, or it's not that they forget, but they are not accustomed to you going to them to say, I have a problem, 
or, you know, I'm feeling down in the dumps. I've been feeling this way. And, you know, I would expect an intimate friend to say, well, tell me what's going on. What's happening? How can I, how can I help? How do you get to that level with somebody? Because I, I think I want to focus on this degrees of friendship. And you're so right. Like, how someone has to know you well enough then to say it seems like you need help, especially since it doesn't seem like it's your you you're keen to say I need it. Yeah, no, I'm. You know, it's actually it's something that um, something I find very hard to say, or to you know, and generally I will sit with whatever issue or problem I have for a very long time. Um, and then when I realize, you know, it's really getting to me, I need, I need to have another, I need to have a pair of ears hear me say what's on my mind and what's troubling me. Mm -hmm. Often, that's almost all that I need to at least bring down the anxiety I may be feeling about it. Sure. But then there are a few people whose thoughts and opinions I respect. Mm. And it's usually people who think more cerebrally than I do. I'm a very emotional person, so everything is high emotion with me. I understand that. Okay. Now, how do you get to that? Well, firstly, there needs to be a certain criteria that's met. So throughout the length of time of your friendship, which, you know, they generally start off as uh, acquaintances and then, you know, time goes on and you maybe share something that's a little more personal and then maybe they'll share something a little more personal. So, But what needs to take place is firstly that give and take. So they have to be willing to um, share some of their personal feelings. Now, I will tell you this, many people do not have the capability to go deep into themselves mm -hmm. and have the kind of introspection that perhaps I've had. Sure. So those are the people that if you do respect their opinion about something, it's best to keep it on a level that is not particularly an emotional level. Wow. So that's a different degree of friendship is yes. recognizing yes. that they are not able to be there emotionally. Right. It's it's not that they don't want to be, uh, but if you, and it's not hard to see, because if you get to know this person, you get to know how they react to certain situations and you get to see uh, the level of discomfort that they're feeling if they have to be anything but a degree under superficiality. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, so so you know that you can't go to those people because they simply don't understand, only because this is how they have dealt with the difficulties in their life. So I love my mother and... And, you know, I actually envy a lot of women, let's say, that can be friends with their mom. My mom's my best friend. And I know every normal woman, even, not just you and I, you know, you have some bumps on the road of, like, trying to figure out who the alpha woman is in a household or just puberty comes along and your mother's the worst. I know in particular I had a tough time with my mother because of my dad. I would have anyway just because – teenagehood asks a lot out of a hormonal girl and a mother. But then you come through that and in your 20s and 30s and you start realizing how wonderful your mother is and you can talk to her about, oh, I don't I don't have a best friend in my mother. She's a very emotional person. She's not unintelligent, but she doesn't have a lot of self-introspection. I've had to go to therapy to deal with so many things. I can't go to her with my deep problems to talk to her about them and get, I, I, she is better on a superficial level. Unless I need my mommy, which is different. You know, sometimes you need your mommy and I'm having a bad day and I just need to talk to my mom and cry about my dead cat or something. But I don't, I can't, 
I, not that I expect my mother to be my friend. I just, I, I can, I can reflect what you're saying in knowing that my mom's just not capable to be that kind of person. So I get to enjoy her talking about cats or talking about other things, but we don't get to talk about deep thought processes. Does that make sense how I'm it, categorizing oh, it that? Great, it makes a great deal of sense. As I say, not everybody, um, and it doesn't make them bad or it doesn't mean they should be less of a friend, you know, but as you develop, th- you know, friendships through life, you learn to, you learn to accept people at their own game, you know, so, you know, listen, this is not something that um, I can really talk to so-and-so about. Right. So let's say that criteria is you need to be, if you want to be in on that sort of intimate level, you have to have someone who experiences at least some degree of introspection and respects the fact that you are going through a difficult time and that these are issues that are important to you. So they're not, second criteria is they're not putting their own crap on you. And so they have to be able to be people who accept this is what is important to you. It doesn't matter if it's not important to me. If I'm listening to your problem, I have to regard and respect your problem is very important to you. I may think, what the hell is she getting herself so worked up about? But that's my take on it. And that's not being a good friend. To me, being a good friend is to be able to, you know, walk in somebody else's shoes, at least give it a shot, you know, try to be in that person's shoes. And it's it, it becomes a bit easier when you really get to know what makes that person tick. So there's that criteria. I, that, I would just categorize that simply as empathy, which um, I think all of us as a, thanks to like people like Brene Brown, I don't know how much you listen to her or have read her. She is so big on vulnerability and empathy, and she's been a real champion for empathy is the ability to say to somebody, oh, I'm having a bad day, and you could say to them, I'm so sorry, as opposed mm-hmm. to let me fix that for you, or uh, here's the silver lining about this bad day. You know, um, the that the someone's ability to do that for you, allow you to sit with your discomfort with you. That's a sign of a very wonderful friend who knows how to be there for you. Exactly. I I think that's right, Lois. Exactly. And then another issue is uh, there can't really be any level of envy or competition because that clouds an intimate relationship. If you have to be concerned that your good fortune is going to make your friend feel bad about herself... That's not a good deal. There, There's one girl who I was getting close to straight out of high school, and we did everything together. And um, I remember we were going to get coffee, the stupid fucking simplest thing that we did every other night to go get coffee. And I was putting mascara on. And she goes, why are you putting makeup on? Do you want to look more pretty than I do? <gasps> She's nineteen twenty telling me that, and I and I had my issues. Don't get me wrong; my parents were going through a divorce. I was the daughter of a narcissist. I I, I have my own things, but even then, I had the emotional intelligence to go get. I and I started pulling away right then and there. <laughs> well, if it so, you were nineteen. Mm-hmm. Well, let me tell you, I've been with eighty year olds. Who have that same mentality. So I'm sorry. Um, (laughs) A few of my friends who are, you know, 20, 25 years younger than I am, uh, in relating stories, they said, but this sounds like high school. I said, it's junior high. Not a whole lot in life really changes. Oh, my goodness gracious. I'm sorry to blow your, you know, blow your concept of 
you know, maturing makes people mature. No, it doesn't. It just gives you a saggy ass (laughs) and saggy jowls and lines on your face. That's what maturing does. Jesus Christ. I have a lot to look forward to then. (laughs) I'm sorry, but that's pretty much what's out there. Yes. So, so far you've given us these really wonderful criteria, the ability to be introspective of themselves, the ability to be empathetic and let listen to your problems and not internalize it or judge you for it Mm -hmm. or try Mm -hmm. to fix your problems. And then the ability to not feel um, in competition. How do you recognize that someone's competing with you or, or, or or like, how do we know when we're, we're trying to compete with somebody too? Cause we can bring that energy into a relationship as well. I guess so. I guess though, I've just never been personally, I've never been competitive with, with another woman. Ah, it is something I definitely experienced and have since once I recognized it, can feel it begin to boil like a kettle in me when I meet a specific woman. And it's so good because I recognize the emotion. But what's interesting, uh, the reason why I kind of like pause on this is when I, when that begins to boil in me, I see it happening in the other woman. So something chemically about us brings Hmm. out a competition factor. I've experienced it with a friend who's close to me now. And they, at the time, they were a little less evolved than I was and behaved in a lot of comp- competitive ways with me and t- took every opportunity to tamp me down and keep me down so that they could stay a little higher in our our world so but but I I wasn't surprised because they they made me feel that way but I was no longer acting on that behavior okay well i mean i've given you what i you know and I, I really can't tell you why. You know, I don't know. I don't know if it goes all the way back to when I was a kid. And um, I had this thing about my bicycle. So when I was born, <laughs> my father went out and bought me a two-wheeler bike. He did not. He did. I think it was like 16 inches. It was a little bike. How? When you were born? Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, I remember his having blocks, you know, wood blocks on the pedal and the pedals. And I was, I think, like two and a half years old, able to ride a two-wheeler bike. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Now, I am now 12 years old. The wooden blocks have long been removed. Sure. And I've still got this little goddamn bike and everybody else has a regular bike. Oh. And I couldn't stop with... So and so has a regular bike. So and so has a twenty-four inch. Why can't I have a twenty-four inch? I'm not gonna. And my dad used to say this over and over, and I think it actually set in my head. And he said, "You know, if you're gonna look at other people, you will never be happy because there's always going to be somebody prettier, richer, and or smarter than you are." So I'm going to let that sit for a while for everybody out there. Let me repeat that. You will never be happy if you are going to look at other people because there will always be somebody prettier, richer, or smarter than you are. And it's really, I can I can truly say, I have never looked at anyone and said, Oh, I wish I had that. I wish I looked like her. I wish I did. No, no, I I just never did. And if, believe me, if, I mean, sometimes I've been so naive when it's come to friendships and because I felt I wasn't worthy of anybody's friendships, I would overcompensate. And it took my shrink joy to say to me, Lois, why do you feel like you always have to pick up the check? Mm-hmm. 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 And it was, I wanted everybody to like me so much. And I truly didn't think, you know, like. You didn't realize that that was a reflection of that. Exactly. Nor did I realize that, um, you know, I really didn't think I was worthy of somebody else's friendship. So putting all that crap aside, because I've gotten, 
you know, beyond that, going back to what we were talking about, yes, I have seen this more, uh, seen the competitiveness or the envy more often than I would like to have seen. Is it is it possible because you're the prettier, smarter, richer person? No, no, no not really. Because um, I think in, you're real pretty and smart. And, <laughs> <laughs> and no longer rich, I can tell you that. But, <laughs> and, uh, but let me say this. I had a friendship for Christ 30 years. 30 years with the most beautiful woman. I mean pregnant, walking down the street, cars used to stop. Beautiful. Wow. And she was very kind and very sweet and all of these things in it. And it went on for, you know, a number of years. And, you know, we moved and, you know, we were bi-coastal. And, and then we started to, you know, she came to the West Coast, not in Los Angeles, but we started to see more of each other. And as I aged, she seemed to have this preconceived notion of what someone my age should be doing or should be wearing or should look like. And I used to just let it go. You know, I will wear spike heels. I still wear them. I can walk in them. Mm -hmm. I like wearing them. Mm -hmm. And she'd say, you shouldn't be wearing those, you know. You could hurt yourself. Are you fucking out of your mind? I've been wearing these since I'm 14 years old. And then it got to the point where it was getting close to, I was dating a younger guy. She was absolutely beyond the beyond about it because not much older than her son. I said, for God's sake, I'm not dating your son. <laughs> and, you know, and I thought, what the hell is this all about? Uh. And then the piece de resistance came when I said I thought I might want to be a life coach. Ooh, 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 ooh. Oh, hello. Ooh. ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Jocular. <laughs> uh, apparently, that hit her right in the jugular. Wow. And she started because she, you know, listen, with all due respect, this woman spent years, years going to night school, driving two hours, blah, 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 to get a master's in social work. And then, you know, spent all the hours interning, blah. I had the, and still have the greatest respect for her having done that. Sure, absolutely. But she took such offense against this that I was, after the what you should look like and what you should be doing and who you should not be dating, Right. I took this as the final straw. Now... I could not under. I said, well, I don't understand. I would never, ever overstep the line of life coach to therapist. There's no, I mean, if I really felt somebody needed therapy and I wasn't just coaching them and encouraging them to do things, I would suggest that they do that. I'm not a therapist. I, I don't pretend to be a therapist. You, didn't, you and, didn't invent this job either. No. And at that point, I thought, you know, there's just something here that's not right. And funny that we're bringing this up because I've given her a lot of thought over the past week or so. I don't know why. Maybe there's something going on in her life. And it was during COVID, you know, when we uh. were isolated. And I said, you know... I need a little break from this. Let me have some time to sit on it. And she said, all right, and then wrote me. She was always very big in writing emails or texts. And, you know, you know, it's COVID and it's been a month and I haven't heard back from you what you're thinking. 
And I wrote her, I said, you know, I'm still not, I'm still not there yet. And I certainly understand the severity of what's going on in the world, but I just need more time. I really just need more time. And she wouldn't give it to me. It was like I had to give her an answer right then and there. Of course, I gave her the answer I would give anyone who backs me in a corner. That's exactly right. And is if you need an answer now, then yes, his friendship's over. And of course, I got these emails about, you know, how I've always discarded friends. Yes, I have. And although I will say she's kept a lot of her friends, but I have seen her friends do the most egregious things to her. And then she'll walk right back into it. Well, that's not where I play my game. And so that was the end of, and and I mean, it was really a very close relationship. Very close. So interesting that you have had this woman on your mind. Yeah. Because I've, the I've been having my old friend on my mind too. I I miss the joyful parts. Oh sure, you of course you do. You know, the ease how we would you know the ease with going and doing things together oh. and um, you know just knowing she was always there and um, you know with a sympathetic ear and she saw me. She saw me through my separation, through my divorce. Uh, but there, you know, she would she would spit out these certain things prior to all of this happening that stopped me in my tracks. And to the point that I said, I never want to hear that person's name again. Well, uh, it sounds like she spun out when you put up a boundary as well, too. Yeah, um, yeah and I would want to stop anybody who would judge you for how you handled that. I actually think you handled that beautifully. The- I just needed time. That's all I needed. I needed time to say, okay, Lois, um, are you really prepared to throw out 30, 35 years? And maybe once you reach um, a point within your own head and thought all of this through, perhaps you can sit down and say, have a discussion about this and, you know, talk it out and see where things lie before you make your final decision. But when she said, you know, I thought, well, what is this to have, you know, we've broken up and I got to give you an answer in 30 days, whether I'm going to go back with you or not. No. And, you know, also, it was just something that I saw that, you know, she blamed, she blamed her ex-husband for her poor relationship with her children, which I'm not really so sure that that was 100% the case. So at any rate, that was that. So those are, that's my criteria and a little bit of uh, a friend that um, I never expected to ever lose in my life. I really didn't. Well, I appreciate anyway. you sharing it. It's yeah. Not, it's not an easy, even though I knew walking away was the best thing mm-hmm. for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you knew that if this person is going to continue down this path, there's oh, not much no, of a relationship no, no, no. here. No, no, no. Mm-mm. But it's pain. The pain is there. The pain is real. Um, and and the truth can also remain that she was the a very good friend for those years before that, you know, slowly eroding over time, you know. Well, you know, my head went to, if she were taking her head out of her behind for Uh a moment and let me have time to mull it over, I would have come up with, I would never go across the boundary of where a therapist should be called in. So if that is the case, would you be open to my referring you? Win-win. End of story. I the the close girlfriends I have in my life right now, I met all through my acting career. And you know how I knew that these were keepers. One of them had a great agent, and she sent all seven of us to that agent. 
this is a this is the acting group improv group we're in and she goes hey who wants to be referred no anytime someone's at an audition and they think i'm right for it they call me vice versa no everyone helps each other with tapes and and suggest and you know what it is you could say it's a competitive field oh very much so and very much so so yes so so if you found these people in your life that are really coming from the mindset of high tide rises all ships that's that was just one of the indicators that i found myself in in friendships you you you, another thing you talked about real quick just to kind of wrap up my thoughts too is like not feeling worthy of friendships i think i felt that way too i think that's where my desire to be unconditionally loved came from um and that's something i constantly work on still is that my worthiness of being uh, a friend basically everything you just said are criteria for close relationships we also have to be able to bring to the table that's how we're able to recognize it too sure sure As, anyway okay. i just want to thank you so much for sharing those thoughts i think it's I've, i have a lot to reflect on we want to hear from you are there any relationships you're currently struggling with um or is there someone in your life that you're missing but you know that you can't go but go back to or curious about how you could be a better friend. You could email us at silver and sensational at gmail.com. You can also find us on social media on Instagram and Facebook at silver and sensational. We're also on TikTok sharing our little thoughts over there also at silver and sensational. If they're watching us on YouTube, Lois, what is their job right now? If you're watching on YouTube, we would love for you to subscribe. And share, share it with everybody in your contact list, doctors, lawyers, life other coaches. moms, life coaches. Yes, those life coaches <laughs> and all the therapists you have in there. In addition, hit the like button and <laughs> press the notification where you'll be notified when a new episode drops, which happens to really be every Friday. And in the meantime, thank you so very much for tuning in. Please share us again with your friends. Jessica, always a delight. Great topic. I hope I've been of some help. I learned a lot, Lois, so thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next Friday. You bet. Bye now. Bye. Thanks so much for watching us today. And please hit like, subscribe, and do share us with your friends. And again, we love having you as our audience. Stay with us. See us every Friday for a new episode.